All right, good afternoon. I'm Tom Bisequino, uh, NAOP President and CEO, and I am very pleased to be the cleanup batter. And if you want to break out into spontaneous applause at any time, I will not be insulted. Okay, thank you, thank you. And uh, which staff member put me on last? Raise your hand. Okay. Anyway, um, today I have the uh, pleasure to talk about a trip that we took to Panama. And I know throughout the conference you've heard lots of different information regarding the Panama Canal. And um, NAOP's Research Foundation, which is a separate organization, uh, our governors were the uh, folks that got behind the trip. And we went to, um, we went to Panama in uh, late February, early March. And we were there for about five days. Flew in on a Monday, flew out on a Friday. And the purpose of this is just to give you a little flavor or snapshot of what we saw and what we heard. Um, so I want to talk about the purpose, some factoids about the canal, uh, show you a very short background video, um, talk about a project, a very interesting project uh, called Pan Pacifico, a little overview on that, talk about the port of Cologne, which is on the Atlantic side, and I think we had some aha moments there, and then uh, talk about the expansion, which you, many of you have heard about, and the new uh, Miraflores locks. And then uh, some takeaways. So the purpose of the trip was to look firsthand at the impact of the canal expansion on the supply chain. And obviously, we've all heard about this for years. We know that in 2014, the canal is scheduled to be widened. And actually, it is the locks, not the canal, that are being widened. Um, we also want to get a better understanding of the capacity uh, involved with Panama as far as adding value. And I think that was one of the bigger ahas, is that Panama just isn't a place where you're taking a shortcut. Uh, there is a lot of value add going on, particularly as we went to the port of Cologne. And then we looked at this project to say, what are the uh, investment uh, opportunities, you know, as far as Panama, Panama City, and the, uh, the whole CBD area. So a um, couple of quick factoids. France started the project in 1880. And then by uh, 1889, they abandoned it when they figured out, you know, they just couldn't do it. And for the engineers in the room, I know you all know that France did not engineer a lock system in. They were going to build a flat ditch, so to speak, from the Pacific to the Atlantic. And that certainly isn't what happened. Over 25,000 people died, mostly of malaria. Um, Panama declared its independence in 1903 about 15 minutes after the U.S. warships showed up. And uh, soon after that, we had a deal to dig this canal. It's nothing really has changed in politics in 100 years. Um, the total cost incurred by the U.S. at the time was about 300, $375 million, which at that time was the highest that any government had uh, spent. Uh, the canal started 24 operations in 1963 with the introduction of fluorescent lighting. By 1999, Panama had taken over the ownership when Jimmy Carter decided that it was no longer uh, a possession we wanted to have. Um, 37 ships cross it daily. Uh, a ship, you heard this yesterday, will pay about 250000 depending on the size of the ship, uh, one way. Um, what was very interesting, we found out that 36 of those transits are reservations system. And the reservations are sometimes made upwards of a year or a year and a half in advance. Now, what about the 37th? What they do for that 37th slot, they auction it off. So if you're a captain and you missed your slot and you got to get through the canal, you can uh, daily participate in an auction. And they said the auction prices will vary between 350 to 400,000 for that slot. And then you pay the additional 250 on top. So Obviously, uh, you don't want to miss your slot. Um, Twelve to 15,000 ships cross the Panama Canal each year. It takes eight to 10 hours to transit, 12 hours east to west, 12 hours west to east. Um, obviously, the U.S. didn't go at the level canal. You are raised to 85 feet in the middle, which is Lake Catan, which is a, a man-made lake, and then you're lowered 85 feet to reach either the Pacific or Atlantic, depending on where you're going. And then um, in September of 2007, the canal expansion project began uh, with completion date, and I think they're going to be on time, 2014. Seven-year project, 
incredible, incredible amount of horsepower. Uh, over 10,000 workers are working 24-7, 52 weeks of the year. Uh, it, it really is uh, a, a quite a sight to behold. So with that, I'd like to uh, show you just a little quick video, and then we'll get into some of our slides we took. Okay. All right. What's this? Almost a century ago, workers from all over the world came to the Isthmus of Panama to be part of a historical endeavor the construction of a canal that would connect two oceans. Today, the country undertakes another colossal project that will allow the transit of vessels with greater capacity. We refer to the imposing post-Panamax ships that can carry three times the cargo of the Panamax vessels that cross the canal nowadays. The differences are obvious if we compare numbers. The post-Panamax ships are 24% longer and 52% wider. If we stood one of them upright next to the Empire State Building, it would have almost the same height of the tallest building in New York City. With such extraordinary proportions, the expanded canal must build a new channel where the post-Panamax ships can traverse the Pacific side. It will be a 6.1 kilometer access channel that will require the excavation of 50 million cubic meters of material. Completing the dry excavation projects Contractor John Denul dredges the 1.6 kilometer entrance of this new channel. This activity started back in November 2010 with the goal of removing 3.8 million cubic meters of material. The first section of the channel was flooded in October 2011. It filled in three days with 1.4 million cubic meters of water. The new access channel includes the construction of the Borinquen Dam by the end of this year. The 2.3 kilometer long barrier will separate the waters of Miraflores Lake from the new access channel, thus allowing its operation 9 meters above lake level. Another challenge for the expansion is to make the current oceanic entrances apt for 15 meter draft vessels. Similarly, a dredging project is required along the Culebra Cut and Gatun Lake. The objective, to widen and deepen the area for post-Panamax transit. To achieve this, contractors and the canal have invested in reliable equipment. At the beginning of 2011, one of the world's most powerful dredges arrived in Panama, the D'Artagnan. A few kilometers north of where the D'Artagnan is working, the largest and most complex contract of the expansion program is being executed, the third set of locks construction. A crucial phase of this project, the placing of permanent concrete, started in June of 2011. The contractor built two industrial parks, one on the Pacific and one on the Atlantic side, that will produce the 4.8 million cubic meters of concrete required for the locks. These are considered the largest in the region. Each park is able to produce up to 500 cubic meters of concrete per hour. While the construction moves forward, 
the magnitude of the future locks is already noticeable. Heavy equipment and workers become small facing the dimensions of the locks gates. They will weigh up to 3,700 tons each. Once built, this is where the 55 meter wide locks will be. But not everything is digging and dredging. Reforestation, wildlife, archaeology and paleontology are also part of the expansion program. In a joint venture with environmental authorities, the Panama Canal will reforest 1,200 hectares around the country. There are also discoveries of archaeological and paleontological treasures, like this dagger from the 16th century and this manatee fossil. The expansion of the Panama Canal represents the hard work of thousands of Panamanians committed to make it a symbol of national pride and an international model. Great. So that gives you a little historic background of where the canal came from and where it's headed. And obviously, um, you know, in 2014, when it's scheduled to be widened, will be the 100th anniversary of the canal originally opening. So as I said, uh, our mission was to really take a look around Panama. We started on the Pacific side looking at Pan Pacific Project. The next day we headed over to the Port of Cologne to look there, and then we ended up uh, looking at the Miraflores Lock and the expansion project. So Pan Pacifico, so London and regional properties is being developed on the site, based in London and one of the largest privately held companies in Europe. Uh, the $750 million project is based in the former Howard Air Force Base. So there are still uh, air strips there and a lot of the older buildings. You'll see the pictures that were considered the Army barracks and some of the facilities. It's on over 2,000 acres of land. Um, and due to the site's proximity to the Panama Canal and the unused airstrip, uh, the play is this hub for international trade and commerce, though to fast forward, the group that we were with, I think that uh, we believe that that may take some time. Some time is the key. Um, again, situated near the Panama Canal, uh, has access to both the oceans, ports, rails. 15 minutes from downtown, you'll see some pictures where you can see the vista of Panama City in the back, and it's 35 minutes from their airport. Um, they have put in the uh, infrastructure for the site, and they're trying to bring in, uh, obviously, high-speed communications, fiber optics. Um, here, you'll see the site is at the bottom of the slide. It's down here is where the site is. Obviously, to the right of the site is the Pacific Ocean. Here is the canal. Here's Lake Catan. And it comes through, and your exit port is here. And here's the port of Cologne. The development ob uh, objectives, 10.5 million square feet of new commercial, 4 billion in total investments. Uh, when fully built out, they expect to have 20,000 new residents, 40,000 new jobs, and 1,500 construction jobs. These are the kind of stats we'd like to have in Washington these days, but uh, we don't seem to be able to get the new jobs. If you look in the new, uh, up in the northern part of this picture, the top of the picture, that's where the project is. This is downtown Panama City. Separating the two, obviously, right here would be the canal. So you get a sense of where it's located. Now, if you notice there's a, a, a drop in the quality of the photos, that's because I was the photographer, okay? So in the full disclosure, they're a little blurry. This, uh, this is the entrance to the, uh, the business park, some amenities. Here was the visitor's center. And um, again, I apologize for some of the uh, fancy camera work here, but you'll see that they, uh, this was their rendering or their model of when the entire project would be built out. If you look in the upper right hand corner, you'll see the old uh, runways that are still there. For those of you who know Bob Cutlip, who's the former chairman of NAOP and also the chair of our research foundation, Bob was there. And actually, Bob is supposed to be my co-presenter today, and uh, he owes me a big one. Um, the site was a little eerie, and I think we have uh, Gary's here. 
There were a few people were on it. In the sense that there were buildings that were going up, but we were there during a weekday. We didn't see much activity. So you really sense that the project might have been a little bit uh, less than robust. Um, here are some of the grounds. You see some of the companies here. These were um, light manufacturing, local distribution. Uh, Dell was here with a call center. Again, um, nothing compared to what we would consider our, our standards here for industrial manufacturing. Uh, here we're in one facility. They don't do tilt up uh, or precast. They don't have the, uh, the capacity or the construction uh, expertise to do that. So you see a lot of this, uh, what would be considered leading edge product here in the States maybe 30 years ago. Um, skylighting, I mean, this is, uh, and you know, we, we were talking to our tour guides trying to get a sense of what the play here was, and um, you didn't get very, very good specifics. Here's the old parade grounds where the military would march. Um, you'll see some of the older buildings, and there's no such thing as national uh, historic preservation. All right, I mean, some of these buildings were actually quite charming. Now, uh, you know, but, but their play is you knock them down and you're going to build something else. Here's a perspective of, of the project. You can see some of the new construction in the back. Um, if you look in, in the fog, you can see some high rise. That's Panama City. So we're literally looking across the canal uh, back towards Panama City. Uh, this is what they're doing for residential. And again, if you notice, there's an absence of workers there. Um, that seemed to be something we all noticed. Um, but this is what's going up. And then they have their condos, which had just opened. And our tour guide, who was the marketing person for um, Forest City's uh, Sta uh, Stapleton project in Denver, she had just moved to um, Panama City and is now representing this project. You get a sense of where they are in the whole sense. So that gave you a quick little feel for that project. The second day we, we um, took off to the port of Cologne, that's also the port of Manzanillo, and um, I think we were kind of surprised. Very uh, different from Panama City, uh, clearly a little more grittier, a little bit more uh, industrial, um, a lot of activity taking place. This is the Pacific side, so this is when we were Leaving, this is where the, a lot of the large uh, 10, 12,000 TEU ships are offloading here. And then there's a transshipment of the goods to Cologne over on the Atlantic side. And I naively thought that the goods were just then reloaded onto a smaller vessel or maybe a larger vessel. But not true. A lot of it is worked. A lot of it is value added. So it's kind of interesting to see. Um, Again, this is the Pacific side where they're offloading their goods. Now, magic, we're over in the port of Cologne going in, and you can see the containers here. Uh, some of them are going to be loaded onto, obviously, ships. Um, and we were uh, afforded the, um, we went into their kind of logistics center, and, you, you know, it's amazing to see where all these goods are going. I mean, obviously, uh, the majority of this audience is U.S.-based, um, and we tend to think the world revolves around us. Well, it doesn't. I mean, a lot of these goods are going all over the globe. And when you see the routes of where these things are going, it's, it's amazing, particularly with the explosion of countries like Brazil uh, and their middle class consumerism on the, on the rise. So you, the typical port. Um, interesting story on the cranes. Um, and, you know, we've been, obviously, we do this program in L.A., uh, we've talked to folks there. A couple of years ago, we did a China tour. So we were in the uh, port of Shanghai. We did Shenzhen. Um, we've done a lot of different ports. But they have remote crane operators. So they had cranes, the technology, where the crane operator is not sitting up, but is sitting in a building with a joystick. And through cameras, are getting a 360 look at that box they're picking up off the ship or dropping back in. Uh, and they're saying they get a much better view of the container than the, than the guys that are up there. And guess what? They're more efficient, allegedly. They're saying they're more efficient. And they're saying one of the major reasons that that technology is not in the U.S. is? Union. Thank you. Right answer. Union. Efficiency. What's that? So here are more cranes, boxes. 
You know, it's funny, when I did this presentation, my wife looks at it and goes, do people really want to see this stuff? I said, yeah, I'm going to be an audience where people really like looking at containers. There's a container ship, more cranes, more containers. Uh, forklift, stacking them, reefers, and they gave us the whole story about the reefers and how they can't go cold, and they can tell you exactly what the average temperature is in that reefer from the point that it gets packed to the point it gets unpacked, and the client or user wants to make damn sure the temperature never gets above it. Um, so obviously we have more reefers shipped from London. Now, I'm a boater, okay? So what kind of drew my attention was this little thing here. All right, I'm going, what the heck is that? It's a, I think it's an escape pod, this little guy right here. So who chooses who gets in that and when is the question. At what point does the captain say, ah, I'm leaving? Um, but either case, interesting, I was fixating on the escape pod. Uh, this one, again, I just thought this was neat, alcoholic beverage, um, rather large tank. Not alcohol, but alcohol beverage. Tires coming in. A lot of equipment, and I'll talk about the equipment in a second. All right. This large ship behind it is known as a row row. Okay, roll on, roll off. And what they do is they roll on some very big equipment and they roll off some very big equipment. Okay, and you can start to see some of them. That's the entryway. Now, look at these pictures. What is that piece of equipment missing? Bucket. Why? Why is it missing a bucket? It's missing a bucket because that's a customizable item. Each user may want a different size or type of bucket. And guess where that bucket gets customized? Panama, right? The other thing that we learned was a lot of this equipment is not new. It's refurbished. So a lot of the older U.S. heavy uh, equipment ends up in Panama, and they refurbish it, motor, the whole nine yards, tires, they paint it put the bucket that the user wants, and it rolls on. So you can see all these equipment that are bucketless. This is the Port of Cologne's free trade zone. It's business to business, B2B, and we did a tour through there, and uh, tremendous uh, activity. And they have both some of the big players in the world as well as some of the smaller players. All right, so now we're in Cologne, and we have to get back to the, uh, to the Pacific side where we're staying in Panama City and they have the Panama Canal Railway. And it's very interesting because that's the same railway that all the freight coming from the Pacific side to the Atlantic side is on. There's only one train or, or passenger train a day that goes from Pacific to the Atlantic, Port of Cologne, and it sits there all day, and then at about 4.35, it heads back. The rest of the day, that rail line is being used by freight, and they do double stack. Um, so here's the... Uh, Train was kind of charming. Here's our group up. We had a uh, we had a private car, and we were up. To, how nice, how bougie. We were we were up there. Um, it was very very nice, and that was our tour guide. And it runs obviously parallel to the canal, so we got a few shots of of the canal as we were heading back to the Pacific side. That's Lake Catan. You can see the size of it. Looking through the train. Good shot of the canal. And now we are in the Pacific side. And here's my favorite shot as I stood on the tracks taking this shot. Great perspective. All right. So our last day we spent looking at the expansion of the, of the canal and the project. Um, you've heard it's going to double the capacity by 2014, uh, larger ships to transit, um, creates a new lane of traffic along. You know. One of the things that also was surprising is um, they bypassed, and they say locked, there's a series of locks, so there's three sets. So in some of these sets, they were bypassing the three steps, and they were going with one or two steps, and how they did that is they kept the water at a higher level until they dropped off to the, to the new lock. Um, and again, the two locks, each with three chambers, and they have this whole water-saving eco deal where the water will get recycled as opposed to being flushed out. Um, excavation new access channel uh, began in 2007, 5 and 5.2 billion. Current lock size, 1,000 uh, by 110, okay? And uh, the new lock size is 1,400 feet long. So it's 400 feet longer, and it's 70 feet wider, 
and approximately 20 feet deeper. Um, and when you see some of the pictures, because we had unbelievable access, um, we literally, I mean, if this was the canal, the stage was the canal, I mean, we're standing right here, um, and we saw a cargo, um, a grain ship come by, and it had inches, inches on either side. So this uh, space is, is needed. And again, we talked about the, the ships generally are going from 4,000 to 12,000. So here's the third sets of lock project that we went to. Um, again, this picture is not that great, but you can see, if you look at the top, this gray area is the canal. The bottom part is the project. Shows you some of the excavation elevations and what they're, what they're moving as far as, as far as dirt's concerned. Here's actual pictures of the canal. In the, in the front of this slide is where the digging's going on, and that's the existing canal as it sits. You see a ship going in right now, and there they are, and then they're coming out. That's a car carrier. The big boxes are the car carriers, and he's coming in and he's coming out. Here's some of the uh, dirt that's being moved, and they have these huge Terex trucks in there that from our vantage point look like little Tonka toys. Um, it was incredible to see all the dirt that was being moved. Give you a little flavor for that. Here are the uh, surveyors, I mean, and you have no perspective, but they are literally probably on about an 800-foot cliff there. I mean, if they took one more step, they were going over. I mean, let me tell you, OSHA doesn't exist. And I, I'll show you that in a second. It's incredible. Here's some of the terracing they did. Again, the project, a lot of shots as they were, were digging trucks. Here are the core samples they're taking. And I noticed in that video we had, they talked about the cement. So here are all the different cores they're taking to test it and test the cement. Now, we found it a little interesting that they chose to put some of the cement in this very high-end children's pool. And, you know, we were kind of laughing about it, and we're trying to figure out. I mean, here's this, you know, $29 pool, and this is a billion-dollar project. And this was outside of a building that wasn't part of our tour, but we were waiting um, so one of the, uh, one of the um, workers saw us, and I think he felt really bad that we were going to leave with some impression that they were using kids' pools. So uh, he took us inside. He took us inside, and they really did have a, a fully uh, full-flown lo logistical kind of testing center, and uh, we did feel a little bit better. Um, here's the site of the locks. The new locks, as you saw in the video, won't be swing locks. They're going to come across. Um, if you notice right in the center here, there, there's uh, spacing, and it's right here, group on that side. And we asked about that, and what they said was those are going to be access tunnels for the workers once the canal is in and the locks are operative, and when they have to do maintenance, they're going to pump out those tunnels, and then they'll come from the side and crawl under and get access to the gates, which I thought was a great job. You see pumping concrete in from the sides, the workers. If this association gig doesn't work, I'm thinking about lock builder. Um, not a bad, that's, a, that's a laugh line, guys. I mean, come on. Here's again the, uh, the tunnel. Scope of the project. You can see the existing canal behind it. Now we're, we're actually at the, uh, the lock, the Miraflores existing lock. And here's a grain ship that's coming in. You can see the lock it's going to go into. And I think everyone knows how these things work. I mean, they let the water out of one, it goes in the other, it equalizes, they open the lock. The lock is being powered by a 24 horsepower motor, okay? 24 horsepower because they're hollow, so they're, they're buoyant. Here's Gary Havner, who's here. And Gary right now is going, you know, 240 volts. <laughs> Just exactly where is that? See, they have the train, the electric crane that pulls the ships through, and our tour guide very calmly says, you know, don't step over there, it's 240 volts. <laughs> so uh, I'm trying to figure out just exactly what did he mean. Um, it's coming into the lock, there's obviously a little tour ship here, those are the gates, interesting, those are the original gates built in 1914 in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, okay? Um, and obviously they maintain those gates because they're still here today. Ship comes in, water starts going down, ship goes down, water's still going down, ship's going down more. Now look at the passenger uh, ship, you can hardly see it. And it really, uh, let me tell you, this process is probably over about two, three minutes. Happens very, very quickly, now the ship's all the way down. 
Okay, so now the gates open up. And parallel to it is another set of locks, and this uh, auto carrier is coming in. So as this ship is moving, that one's just entering its gate. Here are the electrical uh, trams or trains that pull it along. And they have a series of very heavy steel cables, which they work those cables to make sure. Now, if you look at the bottom of the slide and the ship, you'll see how tight this is when, when it's coming through. I mean, it's uh, now he's pulling it down. Now, look at that shot. I mean, there's literally inches between that ship and the side of the canal. Um, not much room to spare. And here's the ship moving through, deck crew. Captain's up there waving at us. And now the gates close, and they have one more step down. All right, so in summary, what are the takeaways? Um, you know, we got the sense that, you know, there, there's a whole big, um, you know, where are we going to get our labor to work? You know, where are we going to get our labor for all these new jobs? And the Panamanians are investing a lot of money to increase their, their skill level. Um, I, I think most of the group came away that there really wasn't a huge commercial real estate play at this point. I mean, you know, downtown or the CBD in Panama City, you had some multinational companies. HSBC is building their headquarters for the Americas there. You know, that, that's happening. But, but from, from our measurement of commercial, there really wasn't that much opportunity at this point. Um, as I said, financial services. Uh, you know, they're, they're set to take advantage, you know, of what's happening in these other areas uh, other than the United States. I mean, the United States as well. You know, and like in the Port of Cologne, like one of the value adds, I talked about the bucket. They also did something as simple as box sneakers, taking sneakers out, boxing them, pricing them, repacking them, and having them go into the final user. Um, so, you know, they're looking for their niche and where they can, where they can add to it. Um, as I said, it's more than a shortcut. You know, they're really interested in the whole global supply chain and where they fit and how they'll continue. And we found the folks to be very, very worldly in their perspective, um, very entrepreneurial, uh, and came away impressed. And then, you know, we've said this throughout the conference, to stay competitive, U.S. ports, obviously, uh, East Coast, et cetera, will have to invest heavily in the infrastructure. I know here the Bayonne Bridge is going to be raised. Uh, Norfolk is probably in pretty good shape. Uh, Port of Houston needs to have a channel uh, 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 dredged. I know Savannah is going to looking at it. Miami's looking at it. So I think it's going to impact, obviously, the distribution of goods. Um, really haven't talked all that much about the impact to L.A. Long Beach. Um, but, you know, that, that is uh, already trying to get, you know, four quarts into a pint. So probably not going to have all that amount of impact. Um, quick, a lot of pictures. I apologize for it, but we wanted to give you a little flavor of what we saw, what we heard. Uh, I'd be more than happy to answer any quick questions you may have. Curtis? Yeah. The second bullet right here? Yeah. Okay, the, the second bullet point of the, the value add, I understand it on the uh, buckets right. and refurbishing equipment, right. but it strikes me as really odd to open a container yeah. and do anything with it for semi-finished goods coming, other than the possibility that it takes some of that business out of Miami, the freight forwarding business. Right mm -hmm. now, if I'm in Ecuador and I ship to Guatemala, I go to Miami first, right. get consolidated, and it comes back. That's the way supply chains work. Panama has the opportunity to do this, but did you see any real evidence of value added happening relative to container traffic? Minimum. This is all their hopes and desires. Yeah, good point. Good point. Questions, thoughts? After this, I have my summer vacation from last year. I know you're, you're going to want to see that. Jonathan. How long does it typically take one of these ships to make it from one side to the other, and how long does it take the train, the passenger train? Well, uh, it was, I was told eight to ten hours to transit the canal from point to point, and the passenger train took us probably 50 minutes, 5-0, yeah, less than an hour, and that included some really great cocktails and uh, wingdings. Um, yeah, it's, not, it's 90 miles. Point to point, it's about 90 miles, so it's not that long. It really isn't. Any other quick questions before we wrap up? Okay, 
Well, I uh, want to thank everybody. Obviously, I don't think you've heard yet that we're recording sessions. Well, you might have heard that a few dozen times. We are recording them, and they will be available in mid-July. Uh, we have our Development 12 conference in Washington, D.C., about two or three, two and a half weeks before the election. We have some great lineup of speakers, so I strongly in everyone uh, to uh, consider coming down to Washington for that. Uh, ICON is scheduled for next year already, June 5 and 6 at the Omni in Los Angeles in L.A., so we would love to see you there. And with that, I thank you for your attention and wish you all safe journey home. Thank you.